Good morning, my friend. How are you? Welcome back. Welcome. Welcome to another edition of Growth Bites. I'm super excited. We spent the, the first three sessions of the year looking at objectives. The first session was more on the setup and how do you think about your team and how do you think about setting your mindset for success in the year. The second one was more about methodologies and what's a good mechanism that you could utilize to deploy your objectives in such a way that is successful, effective, that you can make sure that everybody in your team knows exactly what to do. And the third one, we go, went over some considerations about deploying them, making sure that the monitoring is correct, making sure that everybody knows what they need to be doing. And so that's, that's I think, a good start for the year. With, with that, what I'd like to do is now go into our regular cadence and our regular, let's say, mechanism of just going into the questions. And before we go into that, if you don't know me, I'm Eduardo. I started B Sharp to help people like you. And, and people also who are eager to get promoted, who have been growing, all of a sudden they are feeling stuck, they're feeling like their careers are stalled. And what I do is I come in and I help them, or I help you, unlock growth and break through that barrier, gear, get earmarked for faster promotions and growth, and to eventually make more income over your lifetime, make more money, make the money that you deserve. So if that sounds like you, drop me a comment, the notes, or visit my website, or just get in touch with me. There's Everything is going to be in the description, and I look forward to hearing more from you. Today we have a bunch of very, very good questions. The first one is, what's a typical time between promotions? Remember, what we do here is think about how do I help you accelerate your career? And this, this question is fantastic. My friend, listen, there's no set time. And actually, let me give you some, some tough love here or some, some honest love. Listen, if you are thinking of your career in terms of a watch ticking, if you are feeling like you will get promoted after a certain time mark has been passed, you're thinking about this wrong. That's not what it's about. Your growth is about whether you're ready to take on the next level. Does that make sense? Are you already performing at the level at which you want to be promoted to? So if you're a senior manager and you normally become a director, you should already be performing as a director. People above you, stakeholders, your boss, they need to see you and think he or she is ready to do that next level job because he or she is already performing at that next level. So I know, because they're already performing at that level, that they will be able to also do the, the job above. And so though your focus should be on how do you add value? How do you get to that point quicker where you will be seen as somebody who knows the ins and outs? Let me call it the technicalities, the actual how, who knows the what, what to deliver, when, who to, why, but that also goes beyond mere delivery and adds value, that you're moving the needle, that you really are ready for that next level. So that's when you get promoted. Now, all of that said, typically, on average, you will also see that the more senior you get, the longer promotions take. So if you're at entry level and you wanna to get to the first managerial level, let's say supervisor or maybe manager, depending on what it's called, at your company, it could take between two to three years. Some people do it faster, of course, uh, but it's typically around a couple of years to three years. Then you get promoted to that next level and you start adding time to the next expected lapse of time that you will take to get to the next level. In my case, it was my first promotion. I got it after a year and a half. Then my next promotion after that was almost three years the next promotion after that was slightly over three years, and then it was five years or, or more for the, for the others uh, in general, right? So in, in my case, some promotions came quicker when I was more senior, but 
separate story. In general, answering your question, typically, if you're at a more junior level, let's say entry, and you're waiting for your first promotion, and it's been three years or more, you might want to at least ask questions, go to your supervisor and check in and see what else can you do differently? Is there anything that you need to do differently? If you're at a more senior level and you're around the three year mark, two year mark, depending on how senior, how junior, three, four year, if you're kind of on the higher end of, of, of more senior, same thing. No substitute for going there and asking and making sure that you're doing the right things and you're focusing. But the most important is focus on what is your boss doing? What are his or her peers doing? And how can you behave, show up, and deliver at that level? Don't worry about your competition. Worry about yourself. Worry about being better than you were before, than you were yesterday. And deliver just like you see your boss delivering and her peers or even people above her or above him. That's how you, you accelerate your growth. So don't worry about the time. Don't get so fixated on that. I really wouldn't be too concerned with, with time. So thank you for that question. Let's, let's go for the, for the next one. And the next one, it's actually an important one. Before I go and answer it, spans and layers, just preface it by saying the last few months, I've seen a lot of restructuring work, a lot of uh, companies taking steps to reduce their fixed costs, to reduce costs overall, and to make a more focused use of their resources. It just comes with a sign of the times. There's uh, more supply chain crises that are coming. Some industries are just not seeing the demand that they want. Some are. But for those companies where you're seeing the restructuring happen, restructurings happen, excuse me, where you are seeing the downsizings occur, it's probably because they're not seeing the top line grow like, grow like they had expected. And so companies go into different initiatives to try to lighten their expenses, try to spend less money, try to have their overheads be less as a proportion of their revenues. Spans and layers is one of those tools. And essentially what it is, is they analyze through this study, companies analyze their structure and they say for every leader, how many people are reporting into that person, right? So think about the structure. They look at a structure and they say, okay, this leader has how many people reporting to her. And spans means the, the span of control that you have needs to be as wide as possible so that there's a lighter layer at the higher level to supervise the work that's being done. So spans is span of control, how many people reporting to you, and layers, the more people reporting into you, the wider the span, the less layers the company can have. And think about these two things together. If you have less bosses, and if you have less layers, then overall that results in savings for the company. So that's what spans and layers means when a company is looking at it. It's probably just looking for better ways to, to spend their money, to invest. And I, having been a CFO, I don't blame them. I think that's the right thing to do. The, the worst thing that you can do is just waste the resources of the company. So you need to be efficient with them and this is a good way to do it. Oftentimes it has painful consequences. If companies allow themselves to get too top heavy, there's a lot of chiefs, there's a lot of bosses, there's a lot of heads and managers. It's gonna be a costly structure. So spans and layers is a good tool to analyze to these managers who only have one person reporting into them really need to be there. Sounds crude, but that's what it is. Now, should you be concerned? I, I don't know. The honest answer is, I don't know. It depends on the circumstances. I would say that in general, just because your company is looking at uh, understanding its spans and layers, you should not be concerned. Just 
because they're doing that. You should feel more of an urge to reduce your cost relative to the size of the company. So you should be thinking about how can I supervise more people, not because of the hunger of having a bigger team, but how do you help the company become more, efe more efficient? How do you expand your capabilities so that you can help the company by supervising more people and lighten, lighten up the top layers? So maybe you're already in that good situation where you have a large enough team that's adding enough value and, and you're okay. It depends on circumstances. Maybe not, maybe you have a smaller team and if you analyze your company from CEO to the lowest rung in the ladder, there's probably like 10 levels. That's a, an extremely inefficient and extremely costly organization, right? So world-class companies tend to have anywhere between five and seven layers from CEO to the last level worldwide. So that's probably what your company is, is trying to get to. Should you be concerned? Not necessarily. Talk to your boss, see how you can uh, contribute to the effort, see if you can help consolidate work underneath yourself, and don't do that just to cover your behind, right? Don't do that just to cover yourself and, and get safe, because that's going to be evident that, that you're just trying to do that. There should be a good rationale behind why you want to consolidate things under yourself and how that will result in a broader span, which will then allow the company to reduce layers, okay? So span of control and organizational layers, that's, that's what spans and, and layers is all about. Anonymous asks, any advice to improve my written communication and critical thinking to nail my promotion because that's his or her objective this year. And, and your boss is pointing to those as your opportunity areas. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I think that critical thinking and good communication, I'm not even gonna say written communication, they go hand in hand. Why? Because the only way that you will have a good ability to communicate succinctly and clearly and structure your thoughts in order to express ideas that are complex in a simple, clear fashion will be if you use critical thinking. You see it? Are you with me? So if you are a critical thinker, if you take any given situation, break it down into its components, you try to analyze why it's the way it is. You have a good understanding, you think it through. That's the best way to put it into writing on a piece of paper. If you get a piece of paper, I know that from my CFO days when I got a communication that was well thought out, well structured, it was brief, ideally within a page, and I knew immediately First paragraph, first 30 seconds, I knew what it was about, what was needed, why I needed to spend time on it, and how it could help solve whatever problem. Then that gave me the signal that the person behind the communication was thinking through it. Good critical thinker, good analysis capabilities. And that's why these two are important. How do you get them? Well, there's a lot of trainings and courses on how to improve your written communication. And like I said, by improving how you communicate in written form, verbally, you can almost automatically improve your ability to write clearly, concisely, in an efficient, impactful way. So get the skills. Listen, the, the way I always think about this is you can work and work and suffer through things and knock your head against the wall and get your skills better or you can cut a check for speed. Go get the skills you need. That's the best investment you can do. So you learn how to write succinctly in a way that'll give you some structure 
in which to sort of frame your, in, into which to frame your thoughts, some structure into which to fit your reasoning so that you will be in parallel developing a better ability to think critically and then to put those thoughts on paper in a very well-structured, clear, succinct manner. Practice makes perfect. Even if in your company you don't need to write mails or memos. I'm ancient, so when I was growing up, we needed to communicate in writing in paper, actually, then in mail. But there's a lot of written documents that I needed to do as I was growing my career. With email and then Slack and then other tools, it's a little bit less prevalent. Nevertheless, you still need to learn how to write clearly because that's an indication and it forces you to develop that clear thinking, right? So get the skills, get the trainings, practice. If you don't need to send mails, write something anyway, just so that you know that you have things with such clarity that you can explain it within one page. If you can get to that level, then you can get comfortable that you, can, um, that you understand the concepts clearly enough to convey them in a punchy, succinct, clear, effective way. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Thinking clearly, thinking critically, and writing clearly, effectively, go hand in hand. They're part of the same process. So if your boss is pointing that out to you as opportunity areas, congratulations. I'm happy for you because that's probably the best push he or she is going to give you. If that's the only two things that you're missing, then you're in great shape because once you get them, you have everything else you need, right? He's or she's telling you, you have everything else. You have the technical know-how. You probably know how to lead your team. You probably know how to satisfy your stakeholders. And by the way, even that will improve once you learn to write better and think better and communicate better. So good job. And I'm happy your, your boss did that good for her, good for him, and better for you. So let me know if I can help and if that was clear or otherwise you know where to find me. So that was a, that was a great question. The next one, this is near to my heart. I, I've, um, as you know, I've been CFO and in my road to get there, I was also an internal auditor. I was the head of audit for, for a public company uh, that's based in the Netherlands. And so I have a lot of sympathy for your question here. Essentially what you're saying is you're an auditor, you walk into situations where you're trying to um, not enforce, but to help people see the benefit of acting and delivering and performing within a framework of solid world-class internal controls. Why? Because it protects them. So I understand what you're saying. Your job as an auditor is not to write people up and send reports that are gonna be scathing and make, making people go red right in the face, right? Your job as an auditor, I would even say, even if you watching me are not an auditor, if you're a manager, working in a company. Internal controls are not audits job, they're your job. And that's why to this question, when you as an auditor go in there and get pushed back because people are saying, hey, you go do your audit, let me do my job, I got a business to run, I got things to sell, I got things to build, I have things to connect, I have programs to write, I have reports to prepare, whatever it is, I think that you need to make sure that you are con conveying in a very clear way that your job is not to add to the bureaucracy or to the red tape. Your job is to protect them. So you're not there to give them work. You're there to save them work. As an auditor, I can tell you, if you don't do it, 
You, if you're not an auditor and you have an auditor and you're telling him or her these things, that's a disservice to yourself because you're gonna work more when the audit comes and you get the report and there's a bunch of things that you need to improve. Now you need to go and rework and redo things that you should have done first time right. So your job as an auditor is convey to them that you are actually saving them work. You're helping them add value to their operation by doing things right the first time and helping them see where they need to improve. That's it. Be collaborative. Don't be one of those auditors that you know, go around kicking people who are laying down the ground just because you found them doing something that could be done better. Listen, I was an auditor without having ever been an auditor. I was CFO before I ever got offered the job of auditor and I first didn't want to take it because I was faced with many audits in my career where the only interest of the auditors was to write me up for whatever and show how, sh how sharp they were because they could catch me on as many things that were not perfect. And some of them were really inconsequential. So when I became a head of audit, I just tried to add value and that's what I recommend that you do and help your partners in the other area see that that's what you are all about. It's adding them value or adding, sorry, sorry adding value to them by showing what could be done better, where the risks lie, because those risks are owned by them. Also by you, you're part of the same company, but the point is risks are not your job, they're their job. So you need to help them see that. And, and so that's how I would get into a conversation with them even going in, even starting your engagements, even starting the meeting, the, whatever chat, and help them see that you're not there to give them work. You're not there to just you know, point fingers at them. You're there to help them. And eventually what you do is going to save them work. That makes sense? Let me know if that was helpful or not. If not, just drop a note in the comments and, and we can go uh, some more into that. Thank you for, for, that, um, for that question, I, I liked it. Now there's a new one, and again, I, I'm not surprised to see this. Like I was saying before, there seems to be a lot of activity these days, or the past few months, to reduce expenses, to reduce the cost envelope of companies. So your budget was slashed, I wouldn't say cut, by more than 50%, so that's a significant cut. Does that mean that you're being frozen, like you and your operation, your team, your organization, you're being frozen? Well, not necessarily. Maybe the budget included a growth of 70% in your budget because there were expectations of top line growing at a faster clip than it actually did. And so if you're being cut by 50% or more, you know, it's not as bad as it sounds because you're being caught over a number that was projected to be bigger. So maybe you're close to where you were last year. Maybe you are being cut deep. And based on your question, I would assume that that's the case. You are being asked to make a contribution, to make an effort, and to reprioritize the things that you want to achieve and the things that you will deliver. So it's important that you find ways to concentrate on the things that are more important, on the priorities. And from your question, I think that your team's training is one of those priorities. So there's many ways to think about this. There's many ways to skin a cat, many ways to peel an onion. So reassess your objectives. I started the conversation today by very briefly going over all of the mm, sessions that we did at the beginning of this year to set your objectives correctly. So go back to that. Have a chat with your supervisor. Try to understand what the reason for the cuts is so that you can reallocate your resources to things that will support that pivot that your company is, is making. Training is always a key a key priority. 
in my mind, developing your team is one of your most important jobs as a manager. So I'm happy to see you thinking that way. Take a look at your team. If you were thinking of having everybody go through some kind of training, I would advise that you reassess. Take a look at your nine bucks of grid, right? If, if you create a, a quick matrix where you have performance and potential, you need to focus first on the people who have high performance and high potential. So that would be the top right hand quadrant in such a matrix. We'll go into that in some other session. You need to focus your resources on those people with priority. You might need to only focus on them and set the others aside, put them in the back burner for such a time as when you have more money or when the company starts to do better and you have more money. So prioritize. Who are your key players? Who are the people that you really need to develop and give training only to those one or two or however many, but narrow the scope of the training that you needed to give. Find ways to do more on the job training. Find ways to rotate your people so that they can get learning in different things. Find readings. There's cheaper ways for you and, her, and your organization to get the skills that they need that, that you can go for. So there's online resources. There's people who offer specific training. Go look for those. But I would say that the main answer here is going to be, as with everything, sharpen your priorities. You cannot, you cannot keep uh, on spending at the same level and, and try to do everything that you were setting out to do originally. So that's how I would think about it. Just think of the training. And the rest applies for the rest of your expenses, of course. Don't travel as much. What is really necessary? What do you need to do? Example, travel to move your company's needle forward. Do you really need to travel? Do you need to cut back because you're not going to produce revenues by taking that trip? Well, then don't take the trip. And I'm just using a trip as an example. It could be a system. It could be training. It could be anything else. So priority, priority setting is the, is the name of the game. Talk to your supervisor. Understand the strategy of your company so you can make the pivot in a way that will be the most impactful to help your company get out of that throw, if that's indeed where, where it is. So let me manage time here. We're getting close to the bottom of the hour, and I'm trying to get to all of the questions. I think this is the last one. Why am I not being promoted if I know everything that my boss knows already, and I've been at this two years? So going back to one of the first questions, my friend, your growth is not a matter of a clock ticking. You should not set an alarm for when you're going to get promoted. You're probably early in your career. I know that when I was young in my career so many moons ago, I was more focused on, okay, clock is ticking. When's my next promotion? One year, year and a half, year and eight months. Am I getting promoted? Are you going to promote me tomorrow? So you're more focused on the amount of time between promotions. That's the wrong way to look at it because that's the best way that you're going to get frustrated. Things are different in different companies. It might take a little longer. I would rather focus all of that energy that you're spending on griping because you feel that others are getting promoted faster or you're not getting promoted and you're ready. Well, are you really ready? If you're asking this question with this urgency, are you really ready? Be honest with yourself and analyze yourself. Remember what I said at the top of the conversation. Are you delivering at the level of your boss already? Are you communicating? Are you showing up at that level with that authority? Are you visible in a way that it's credible for you to grow? Answer those questions before looking at the watch or the calendar and saying, I need to be promoted, okay? So don't worry about it. Don't sweat the clock. Don't uh, focus on the time. That's the best way to get an ulcer 
from frustration and, and from, it's just a distraction. So focus on delivering value, focus on delivering that performance that's at the level above yours, at that level you want to get promoted to, and that's how you do it. All right, my friends, that's all I had. And again, my, my name is Eduardo Lopez. I'm very, very happy to be here. I will see you here next week. Keep your eyes out for the invite, and I look forward to, the, to our next conversation. Have a fantastic week. And I'll see you very soon. Take care.